Hello, my name is Zelda Nichols, and I want to thank the organising committee for allowing us to share our research regarding delivering an internet-based intervention opportunities during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I want to thank the study team, particularly the Mayor Manchuria, Joel Anderson, and Mark Agelson for helping with this research. So what we'll be discussing today is outlining the rationale for doing this intervention, the outcomes of the intervention, and our experiences delivering this intervention during the COVID-19 pandemic. So when we look at tinnitus management, there are two main schools of thought. One is trying to reduce the concept of the tinnitus, so to make it less noticeable. And for this, there are medical approaches and often sound-based approaches, so things like sound enrichments and fitting of hearing devices. Another big approach is trying to reduce the reactions to tinnitus and the life effects tinnitus has. And this is generally psychological approaches such as cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and mindfulness. Out of all these approaches, the one with the most evidence of effectiveness is CBT for tinnitus if you look at systematic reviews. So despite all this evidence, and um, there's limited provision of CBT worldwide, um, and there's also not enough tinnitus experts to serve the tinnitus population with any, any approach. So a lot of people tinnitus are underserved. So to try to improve the situation, an internet-based intervention for tinnitus was developed in Sweden by Gerard Anderson and has subsequently been trialed in different countries. So just to give um, you an idea of this intervention, it can be really comprehensive and you can, because it's on the internet, you can deliver to a lot of people with less resources. So that can hopefully be one way of improving accessibility to tinnitus interventions. So because it's online, it's easy to provide quite a comprehensive intervention. So the intervention is based holistically and um, with a lot of CBT strategies, including relaxation and mindfulness, but also includes sound-based approaches because they can be helpful and lots of practical tips on helping people with, for instance, sleep problems or problems with um, hearing difficulties or concentration problems. So this intervention has shown to be effective in clinic trials, but there's no intervention available for the US population. And unfortunately, due to data protection laws, often these interventions need to be adapted to be suitable in um, different countries. So we had to adapt it to make it HIPAA compliant due to the data protection laws. And we also had to adapt it culturally and linguistically to suit a US population before we could run the clinical, clinical trial. Another um, expectation was that interventions are made more accessible by making sure they read, their content is readable to the general population. So we worked at reducing the readability of the intervention to below the sixth grade level. And from that um, graph, the, the horizontal line shows where the sixth grade level was and the last two lines on each um, chart shows that we reduced the the readability from the previous versions. And we also translated the intervention into Spanish to serve the large Hispanic population in the US. After feasibility trial, we ran an efficacy trial. And what we did is we randomized a group of 158 participants into two groups. So the first experimental group had the intervention. So it was an eight week long intervention and while they were doing the intervention, the control group were monitored weekly, but they didn't receive the intervention. After eight weeks, both groups were reassessed to um, see what their outcomes were regarding tinnitus and some secondary outcomes. And after this assessment, the control group received the intervention and the experimental group um, were, were finished with the intervention and they just went through a waiting period after this, another assessment was done, 
and two months after both groups had done the intervention, there was another assessment. So we tried really hard to recruit equal numbers of English and Spanish people, but really struggled and only managed to recruit eight people in Spanish. And the trial was set to run in 2020, and we had recruitment videos up, and recruitment strategies going, external companies helping recruitment. And very early on in 2020, started getting a bit concerned watching what was happening in the pandemic in other countries. And in March, we actually brought the trial forward slightly because we had, we were just concerned what the implications might be of the, all the unknown of the pandemic at that time. The inclusion criteria with people living in Texas and we excluded anyone with severe depression. So for all, overall in this trial, there were equal numbers of males and females with a mean age of 56 years and mean tinnitus duration of 15 years, and um, which represented a sort of the same population as we'd seen in previous clinical trials. So for this intervention, um, this graph shows the different time points. Our top line in sort of blue-green shows a, a steady decline, but the time point one, T1, not that much of a decline, although a small decline, as the decline in the, the sort of orange-pink bar, which showed the experimental group. So after only the experimental group had the intervention, they had a greater decline in the tinnitus severity compared to the control group with an effect size of 0.46. After both groups had the intervention at time point T2, they both had a reduced tinnitus duration, which wasn't significantly different. So the intervention was, um, was beneficial and at two months follow up, both groups had maintained the results of of the, um, of the tinnitus distress and improved slightly more. So we see this reduction over time. And we looked at the magnitude of change in the different groups. So with the main outcome measure, this, it runs between 0 to 100. And we wanted to see how much change could be expected. So with the experimental group of blue lines, a lot of score choice change after the intervention of about um, 20 to, to 50 points score change. And after the control group did the intervention also the same, a lot of people between sort of 10 and, and 30 point difference. So regarding the secondary outcomes, the ones that were significantly different were insomnia and tinnitus cognitions with effect sizes of sort of three and four. And the results for these were also maintained two months post intervention and nobody had any um, adverse effects. So because this is quite an interactive engage, um, intervention, we looked at how people were engaging with the intervention. And then intervention is what we call the guided intervention so people could send the therapist messages. And we found that very few messages were sent so on, on average about one in the whole intervention, which is very unlike other trials. When we looked at the modules read out of 22, an average of about six modules were read, which was also really low. And the logins over the eight week period, about one login a week into the intervention. So this you know, was much lower than we saw previously. Also with the outcome completion, the rates were lower than we'd seen previously. So we looked into this a bit more and, um, and asked people, so what were barriers during the intervention? We found there were quite a few COVID-related barriers. So firstly, people being ill with COVID and just being too fatigued to do anything. Lots of people had increased workload during the pandemic or had to look after family and found just the focus on the pandemic made, made concentrating on an intervention or anything else difficult. And lots of people also mentioned Zoom fatigue being on the computers all day long due to working, just different ways of working and just not wanting to look at the computer after work time. There were some positives though. 
So the, the intervention did help people deal with the daily stresses of the intervention and help them problem solve more and feel less isolated and alone and were able to manage their thoughts during the pandemic better. So overall, there were positives to help people through the pandemic with a wider pandemic effect running the intervention. So I think it was good running the intervention to help individuals. But I think the, the pandemic effects did have an impact on the engagement of the intervention, which is important to put things in place if clinical trials are run during such difficult times. So thank you for listening. I just wanted to thank the wider study team for the involvement in this research. Bye-bye.